Okay, let's start the class. In this lecture, we are going to talk about Deep Reinforcement Learning, which is abbreviated as RL. I believe everyone is not a stranger to RL, to Reinforcement Learning. You already know a lot of trendy applications, like AlphaGo. Behind AlphaGo, it uses the RL technique. There's a lot of techniques about RL that we can talk about. It can't be finished in one class. In fact, if someone wants to teach it for a whole semester, it is actually possible and doable. So today, the purpose of this class is not to tell you everything about RL, but to let everyone have a basic understanding about what RL is. You can find many RL-related courses and a lot of reference materials on the internet. If RL has to be very difficult, it can be very difficult. But for today's class, we try to avoid the part that is too theoretical. I expect this class will not make you feel, wow, RL is very difficult. Not sure what it is doing, but I expect to make you feel, ah, so this is RL. I should be able to do it myself. I hope this class can achieve this goal. Okay, what is reinforcement learning? So far, almost all we talked about is supervised learning. Suppose you want to make an image classifier. Not only should you tell the machine what is the input, you also have to tell the machine what kind of output it should produce. Then, you can train an image classifier. So far, most of the techniques taught in this course are based on the method of supervised learning. Even when we are talking about self-supervised learning, we are actually using a method similar to supervised learning. The only difference is that our label does not need humans to annotate it. It can be generated automatically. Or when we are talking about autoencoder, although we say it is an unsupervised method, we didn't use human for labeling. But in fact, we still have a label. It's just that this label doesn't need humans to produce it. Okay, but RL is a different aspect. In RL, the problem we encountered is like this. When we give the machine an input, we don't know what the best output should be. For example, Suppose you want to ask the machine to learn to play Go. Using the supervised learning method seems to be able to do it. You just tell the machine, when seeing the current situation, where should the next step be? But the problem is, where should the next step be? Which is the best next step? Which step is the divine move? Maybe even humans don't know. Of course, we can let the machine read the game records of many professional Go players. Let the machine read the game records of many grand players. Maybe the answer is in these games. Maybe there is a certain game in these records. The next step is a good answer. But is it the best answer? We do not know. In this case where you don't know what the correct answer is. RL can often come in handy. So when you find it difficult to collect labeled information. And humans don't know the correct answer. Maybe it's when you can consider using RL. But when RL is learning, the machine is not knowing anything at all. Although we don't know the correct answer, the machine will know what is good and what is bad. The machine will interact with the environment and get something called reward. We will talk more about this later. So the machine will know its current output is good or bad by interacting with the environment and by knowing what kind of output is good and what kind of output is bad. The machine can still learn a model. Okay, so, this is the outline of today's slides. First, we will start with the most basic concept of RL. When introducing the concept of RL, there are many different entry points. Perhaps the entry point you have heard more often is the Markov decision process. We chose a different entry point here. I want to tell you, if you read the RL literature, you will feel RL is very complicated. It seems different from ordinary machine learning. But I want to tell you that RL is similar to the machine learning we learned in this course. They are the same framework. In the first class of this semester, I told you that machine learning has three steps. What about RL? RL has the same three steps. I'll explain that to you later. Okay, at the beginning of this course, I have told you what machine learning is. Machine learning is to find a function. Reinforcement learning. RL is also a type of machine learning. It is also looking for a function. What kind of function is it looking for? In reinforcement learning, 
We will have an actor and an environment. This actor will interact with the environment. Your environment will give the actor an observation. The observation is the input of the actor. What about the actor? After seeing this observation, the actor will give an output. The output is called an action, and this action will affect the environment. After the actor takes this action, the environment will give a new observation. Then, the actor will give a new action. This observation is the input of the actor, and this action is the output of the actor. So the actor itself is a function. The actor is the function we are looking for. The input of this function is the observation given by the environment. The output is the action taken by this actor. In the process of this interaction, the environment will continually give this actor some rewards to tell it whether the action you take now is good or not. Finding the actor is equivalent to looking for a proper function. You can take the observation as input and take the action as output. The goal of this function is going to maximize the sum of the rewards received from the environment. We want to find a function and use this function to interact with the environment. Input observation, output action, maximize the sum of the reward. This is the function that RL is looking for. I know, you may still think this is a little abstract. Let's take a more specific example. We are going to use Space Invader as an example. Space Invader is a very simple game. In the first few papers of reinforcement learning, most of them let the machine play this Space Invader game. In Space Invader, what you want to control is the green thing below. The green thing below is your space shuttle. The number of actions that you can take is three. Move left, move right, and fire. Just these three actions. What you are going to do is to kill these aliens on the screen. These yellow things on the screen are aliens. If you fire and hit those aliens, the alien will die. What are these things in front? That is your protective cover. If you accidentally hit your own protective cover, your protective cover will also be broken. You can hide behind the protective cover to block the alien's attack. There will be scores. There will be a score on the screen. When you kill aliens, you will get points. In some versions of Space Invader, there will be a supply package flying across from above. If you hit the supply package, you will get a very high score. And the score is the reward given by the environment. This game will eventually end. When will it end? It will stop when all the aliens are killed. Sometimes the aliens will open fire on your mothership. If the aliens hit your mothership, you will be destroyed. And this game also ends. Okay, this is an introduction to Space Invader. What will it look like if you want to play Space Invader with an actor? Now the actor is a machine. It controls the joystick and the mothership from the same perspective of people fighting the aliens. What exactly is your environment? It's the game console. The game console controls the aliens to attack your mothership. So the observation is the screen of the game. The view for the actor is exactly the same as what the human sees when playing the game, which is the screen of the game. What about the output? The output is the available actions for the actor, which is usually predefined. In this game, there are only three possible actions, which are fire, left, and right. When your actor takes the action to the right, it will get a reward. Because in this game, only killing aliens will get points. If we just define the score as our reward, then the left and the right don't actually kill any aliens. So the reward you get is zero. When you take an action that make the game screen change, you will then get a new observation from the environment. Your actor will decide to take a new action. Your actor is a function. This function will be based on the input observation and the output of the corresponding action. Suppose your actor chooses to fire when a new frame comes in and kills an alien. Then you will get points. Suppose that the score you obtain here is 5 points. The score of killing an alien is 5 points. Then the reward you get is 5. What happened when the actor plays the space invader? What is the goal the actor needs to learn? During playing the game, 
we will keep getting the reward. In the previous example, doing the first action, which is turn to the right, you get zero points. Doing the second action, which is fire, you get five points. Then you take a series of actions that may give you points. What is the learning goal of this actor? The actor we are looking for is the one that gives us the largest sum of rewards. When using this actor or this function in this game, this is what RL is doing when it is used in this little game. If you use RL to play Go, there is no much difference compared to this mini game. The only difference is the scale and the complexity of the game. If you use RL to play Go, then your actor is AlphaGo. What is your environment? Your environment is the human opponent of AlphaGo. What is the input of AlphaGo? What is the input of your actor? The input of your actor is the positions of black and white on the chessboard. If it is at the beginning of the game, then the board is empty. There is no black or white. The actor needs to produce an output to decide its next step after it observes the board. If it's go, the number of probabilities of your output is 19 times 19. Then, for these 19 times 19 probabilities, each probability corresponds to a position on the go board. Okay, we assume that your actor decides to stay in this place. Then, this result will be the input to your environment, which is actually a go player. Then, this environment will generate a new observation. Because this Li Se Dal, the Go player, will take a new step. Then, the environment you see now is different again. While your actor sees this new observation, it will generate a new action again. And so on. You can let the machine do the game of Go. Okay. For the reward in the game of Go, how is it calculated? In Go, almost every action you do has no rewards. In the game of Go, we define that if you win, you could get one point. But if you lose, you get minus one point. That's to say, the whole game of Go, where your actor interacts with the environment, is settled only when the last play of the whole game of Go happen. And then you could get the reward. When your last play finally happen, you win and get one point. After last play finally happen, the game is over. If it loses, you get minus one point. All the reward in the process of interactions in the game count as zero point. There is no reward. Then the learning goal of this actor is to maximize the reward it may get. Okay, maybe you have heard about it. This is the most common way to explain RL. Then I will tell you in the following that what the relation between RL and machine learning framework is. In the first class, I told you that there are three steps in machine learning. The first step is that you have a function with some unknown numbers, which are unknown variables, to be searched. The second step is that you define a loss function. The third step is that you try to find the unknown variables by minimizing your loss, which is also known as optimization. In fact, there are also three steps in RL. We first look at the first step. The first step is in below. We have a function with unknown variables. What is it? This function with unknown variables is our actor. In RL, your actor is just a network, which we usually call it policy network. In the past, before applying deep learning to RL, your actor is relatively simple and usually not a network. It may just be a lookup table, which will tell you what kind of output it generates based on what kind of input it sees. Today, we all know to use a network as this actor. For this network, it's actually a very complicated function. What is the input of this complicated function? Its input is the screen of the game. It's the screen of the game. Here. Since we are not playing the Go, there is no black and white stones. If you take this, which is playing Space Invader, as an example, all the pixels on this game screen is the input of this actor. What is its output? Its output is the score of available actions that can be taken. Every action that can be taken has its corresponding score. For example, you input this screen to your actor. Your actor is actually a network. Its output may be like 0.7 points to the left, 0.2 points to the right, and 0.1 points to fire. Actually, there is no difference to classification. 
you know that classification is to input a picture and output the decision that which category the picture should be. Then, your network will give each category a score. You may pass through a softmax layer. Then each category has a score. And the sum of these scores is 1. Actually in RL, your actor, your policy network, and the classification network, are actually exactly the same. You just enter a picture. In fact, you will also have a softmax layer at the end of the output. Then, you will give left, right and fire. These three actions a score respectively. You will also let the sum of these scores to be 1. As for the architecture of this network, you can design it yourself. You can have whatever architecture you want to design. For example, if the input is a picture, maybe you will want to use CNN to process. But in the teaching assistance code, actually images are not processed by CNN. Because in our homework, when playing the games, we don't just let our machine watch the game screen. It's harder to let it directly watch the game screen. So we let it look at some parameters related to the current game situation. So in homework, in the teaching assistant sample code, it's not as complicated as CNN. It's a simple fully connected network. But suppose you want your actors input as directly the game screen. Then you might consider to use CNN. You may use CNN as the architecture of your network. You might even say that. You don't just look at the game screen at this particular moment in this time. But you also want to see all the things that have happened so far in the whole game. Can it? Yes. In the past, you might use RNN to consider. The current picture and all the pictures in the past. Now you may want to use Transformer. To consider everything that has happened. So the architecture of the network can be designed by yourself. As long as you can input the game screen. And output an action like classification. Then in the end the machine will decide which action to take. Depending on the score obtained by each action. A common practice. Is to directly put this score. As a chance. Then the machine use sampling. To randomly decide which action to take. According to this score. Or probability. For example. In this example. Going to the left and get 0.7 points. That is. There is a 70% chance that it will take the left. 20% chance it will take to the right. 10% chance of firing. Then you might ask, why not use argmax? Why don't just to the left and get the highest score? You can do it. But in TAS sample code, in most RL applications, you will find that we all use sampling. One advantage of sampling is that even if you saw the same game screen today, every action taken by your machine will be slightly different. In many games, this kind of randomness might be important. For example, in rock, paper, scissors. If you always get rocks, just like Doraemon, you will be knocked out very easily. If you have some randomness, you are less likely to be knocked out. In fact, there is another important reason to use random sampling for the output. We'll talk about this later. Okay, so this is the first step. We have a function. This function has unknown variables. We have a network. There are parameters. The parameters are unknown variables. That has to be learned. This is the first step. Then for the next step, we want to define the loss. In RL, what does our loss look like? Let's take a look at the process of our machine interacting with the environment. We just use a different method now to show what I just said. Okay, first, there is an initial game screen. This initial game screen is used as input of your actor. Your actor then outputs an action. For example, to the right. For the input game screen, we call it S1. For the output action, we call it A1. Then we will get a reward now. Here because we don't kill any aliens. When we move to the right, the reward may be zero point. After taking to the right, we will see a new game screen. This is called S2. According to the new game screen S2, your actor will take a new action. Like firing. Here, I use A2. To denote the action taken. When it sees the game screen S2. Let's suppose you shot and killed an alien. Then your actor will. Get a reward. Which is 5 points. After this action. The machine sees a new frame of the game. And it makes another move. So this interactive process. Will keep going. Until the machine takes a certain action. Causing the game to end. When will the game end? It depends on the rules of the game itself. 
For example, the action you took was to move to the right, and you get hit by a bullet from the alien. Your spaceship is destroyed, and the game is over. Or, the last action you took is to fire, and the action killed the last alien. Then the game ended. If you perform a certain action, that meets the conditions of ending the game. The game is over. The whole process from the beginning to the end of the game is called an episode. Throughout the game, the machine will take a lot of actions. The machine might earn some rewards with some of the actions. Summing all the rewards together, we obtain the total reward of the whole game. The total reward is the reward that accumulates all the rewards as the game goes on. Starts from R1 and ends up with RT, which is the total rewards of the game. Suppose there are T interactions in the game. Here, we use the capital R to represent the total reward. The total reward is also called return. You might encounter those two names at the same time. In RL documents, reward and return are actually a bit different. Reward refers to the immediate prize after an action, but the return refers to the sum of the rewards throughout the whole game. But I understand that. You will forget the difference between them soon. So I don't use the word return hereafter. Therefore I will use the total reward to refer to the sum of the rewards throughout the game. The total reward is the target that we want to maximize. But this is different from loss. Loss should be as small as possible, but the total reward should be as big as possible. So it's a bit different. But in the context of RL, we can use the negative total reward as the loss since we want to maximize the total reward obviously we can just minimize the negative total reward we can treat negative total reward as the loss in rl before entering the third step let me answer your questions if you have any do you have any questions good some students suggested that i should turn off the microphone during breaks but sorry, I don't know how to do that. I will try. Okay, it is not bad to talk about pure theory. If you want a more theoretic approach, you can watch the recordings on classes in the past few years. I'd also put some links in the slides. In these links you can find more theoretic approaches. But today, I'm going to provide you a simple explanation of RL. You can still study the theoretic contents with the past recordings of this class. If you want to learn more. Okay, if you don't have any other questions, let's continue to talk about the optimization. Here is a different picture of the interaction of the agent with the environment. So this part is the environment. The environment outputs an observation called S1. S1 will become the input of the actor. The next step of the actor is to output A1. Then the A1 will be the input of the environment again. What about your environment? After seeing A1, it outputs S2. Then this interactive process will continue. Then, S2 is the new input of the actor. The actor outputs A2. A2 is a new input to the environment. And it outputs S3. This interaction continues on until the conditions for stopping the game are satisfied. The sequence formed by different S and different A is called a trajectory, represented by tau. For example, the sequence of S1A1, S2A2, S3A3 is a trajectory. According to this interactive process, the machine will get the reward. You can actually think of reward as a function. We use a green square to represent it. Function formed by this reward has different expressions in some games. Maybe your reward only depends on which action you take. But usually, when we design the reward, it is not enough to solely consider actions. You have to look at the current observation. For example, you won't get points every time you fire. The fire has to hit the alien. You only get points if you fire in front of the alien. So usually when defining the reward function, we consider not only action, but also observation. We can know whether we have scored by considering both action and observation at the same time. So reward is a function. This function takes A1 and S1 as input and produces R1 as output. It takes A2 and S2 as input 
and produces R2 as output, combining all R all together, and adding up R1, R2, R3, and all the way to RT. We can finally get R. This is the total reward, which is the return. This is the term we want to maximize. What does this optimization problem look like? The optimization problem is like this. You are going to find a network. To be more specific, the parameters in the network. You are going to learn a set of parameters. This set of parameters is placed inside the actor. It can make the value of R the bigger the better. That's all. That's it. The whole optimization process is done. You have to find the network parameters. To let the R generated here be the bigger the better. At first glance. If this environment actor and reward are both networks. This question is actually not difficult. Maybe you can solve it now. It looks a bit like a recurrent network. This is a recurrent network. And your loss looks like this. The only difference is that we replace the loss with the reward. So you have to make it bigger to be better. You can use gradient descent to learn the parameters and you can make it the bigger the better. But the point that make RL difficult is that this is not a general optimization problem. Because of your environment, there are many issues here that lead to different training methods from the normal ones. The first question is that the output of your actor is random. This A1 is generated from sampling. Even if you have the same S1, the A1 generated may not be the same every time. So if you combine environment actor with reward, together as a huge network, this network is not normal. There is randomness in this network. The result of a certain layer in this network is different every time. The output of a certain layer in this network is different every time. Another bigger problem is that your environment and reward are not networks at all. It's just a black box. You don't even know what happened inside. Environment is the game console. You don't know what happened in this game console. You only know that if you input something, you will get some outputs. You take an action and it will respond accordingly. But how the corresponding response is generated, we do not know. It's just a black box. And what about the reward? Reward may be more explicit, but it is not a network, either. It's a rule. It is a rule saying that the number of points you will get upon seeing the optimization and the action like this, it's just a rule. So it's not a network. What's worse is that reward and environment is often random too. If we're talking about video games, the reward is usually less random because the rules are fixed. There are some RL problems with rewards that are random. However, randomness still exists in the environment, even in video games. Given the same behavior, the way the game responds could involve randomness and may vary a bit every time. Take Go for example. If we place a stone at the same position every time, the way the opponent responds might not be the same every time. So, there could be some randomness in the environment. This means that this is not a general optimization problem. You may not be able to use what we have learned in this course and find the actor that maximizes the reward by training a network. Therefore, the real difficulty of RL is how to solve the optimization problem. How to find a set of network parameters that maximizes R. If you think about it, there are some similarities between this problem and GON. They have some parts in common and some parts that are different. Let's start with the parts in common. Remember how you trained a GON? You would connect the generator and the discriminator together when training the generator and try to maximize the output of the discriminator by tuning the parameters of the generator. In RL, the actor is analogous to the generator in GON. The environment and reward are analogous to the discriminator in GON. We adjust the parameters of the generator to maximize the output of the discriminator. So, RL and GON have some parts in common. What's different between them? In GON, the discriminator is also a neural network. You know everything about the discriminator. It is a network that can be trained by using gradient descent. To maximize the output. However, in RL, although the reward and the environment can be treated as a discriminator, they are not networks. They are actually a black box that you have no way to tune the parameters and maximize the output. 
by using general gradient descent methods. That's the difference between RL and the normal machine learning. Still, we can divide RL into three stages. It's just that the way we minimize the loss or maximize the reward would be a bit different from what we've learned. Okay, that was about the relationship between RL and the three steps of machine learning. Let's see if any of you have questions. Someone asked why the negative of the total reward is equal to the loss. Why is that? Just like what we've talked about before, when we're doing training, all the training processes in deep learning defines their losses, and we try to minimize the loss. In RL, we define a total reward R and try to maximize it. However, in terms of maximizing the R, we can do it from a different perspective. We can try to minimize negative R, which is just R, with the negative sign. This way, we can define the loss of RL as the negative of R. Next question. Previously, is there also randomness? Since we didn't fix the random seed? Well, these two types of randomness are not the same. When we were training the model, the random seed wasn't fixed. So there is randomness during training. By not fixing the random seed, the parameters may be initialized differently. This way, every time you train, the result is different. However, RL has randomness during testing. In other words, the randomness still persists outside of training. The randomness also exists during testing. If compared to normal training, it would be like having different outputs. When we're doing testing on a trained model, even if we gave it the same input data every time we test it, the output is different every time, which is the randomness of RL. In RL, when we finish training an actor, the parameters of the actor are fixed. However, when you use this actor to interact with the environment, the result is different every time. That's because even if your environment sees the same input, the output may be different every time. All in all, RL is a task with high randomness. As you can imagine, the homework on RL is also quite challenging. Sometimes, it is hard to say how difficult a homework is. RL might be the hardest without any reference materials on the internet might be the hardest without any reference materials on the internet. On the other hand, it is quite easy to find all kinds of code on GitHub. It doesn't seem to be that difficult. However, the randomness of RL algorithms will be very large. Even if it's the same network, your results can be different every time you test. Is it wrong to write argmax below A1? Question. I have been changing my slides. After the first release, ask me if you have any questions about the slides. I just changed this slide before the class. New slides will be released after the class. Okay. Any questions? If you have no questions, then we will continue. We can have a break after finishing this section. Next, we are going to talk about a commonly used algorithm for solving the optimization of RL. It is called policy gradient. If you want to know where did policy gradient come from, you can watch the videos of lessons in the previous years. There is a more detailed derivation of policy gradient. Today, we are going to talk about policy gradient from another point of view. Before talking about policy gradient, let's think about how to control the output of an actor. How do we make an actor take an action when seeing an observation? How do we make an actor output a hat when seeing s? You can think of it as a classification problem. In other words, the actor takes s as input and output a hat. Suppose a hat is left. Assuming you already know that, it's correct to go left when seeing this game scene. You want to teach your actor to go left when seeing this game scene. How do you let your actor learn this? That means S is the input of the actor. And A hat is our label. A hat is our ground truth. A hat is our correct answer. Next, 
you can calculate the cross entropy between the output of the actor and the ground truth. Then you can define a loss. If you want your actor takes a hat, you define a loss. This loss is equal to cross entropy. Then you can learn a theta. You find a theta that can minimize the loss. Then you can make the output of this actor as close to your ground truth as possible. You can let your actor learn. Go left when seeing this game scene. This is what to do when you want your actor to take a certain action. Suppose you want your actor not to take a certain action. How to do it? For instance, you want your actor not to go left when seeing a certain observation s. It is very easy. You need to add a negative sign to loss. You want your actor to take the behavior a hat. You define your capital L as equal to cross entropy and minimize cross entropy. If you want your actor not to take a hat, you will set your loss. As negative cross entropy, cross entropy multiplied by a negative sign. Then you go to minimize this loss. Make the cross entropy as large as possible, which is to make the distance between a and a hat as far as possible. In this way, you can prevent your actor from taking a hat when it sees s. As long as we give the appropriate label and loss, we can make our actor do what we want. What if we want our actor? To take a when seeing s, and not to take a hat prime when seeing s prime. How to do this? Given observation s, we have ground truth a hat. Given observation s prime, we have ground truth a hat prime. For these two pairs of ground truth, we can calculate cross entropy. We can calculate these two cross entropy, e1 and e2. Then, we define our loss as e1 minus e2. In other words, we want to make this cross entropy as small as possible. The cross entropy of this case is the bigger the better. Then, we will get theta star by finding a theta to minimize the loss. It is the actor that can take action a hat when you see s, and take action a hat prime when you see s prime. So it's like the behavior of training a classifier. By this kind of data of training a classifier. We can control the behavior of a and actor. Okay, so far. Does any student want to ask questions? Okay, a classmate asks a very good question. We just took the aliens game as an example. Because only if you shoot alien will there be a reward. Isn't the model always inclined to shoot? We will solve this problem later. We will solve it in later slides. There is another classmate with a very good question. Doesn't it just go back to supervised learning? In this slide, it looks like just training a classifier. We are training the classifier. You just told it that output a hat when seeing s. Don't output a hat prime when you see s prime. Isn't this supervised learning? This is indeed supervised learning. This is the same as the image classifier with supervised learning. But later, we will see the difference between it and the general supervised learning. Okay, let's move on and take a break afterwards. So, if we want to train a an actor, we actually need to collect some training data, like the following condition. I hope to take a one hat at S1. And I hope not to take a two hat in S2. But you may ask where this training material comes from. We'll talk about it later. So you collect a lot of data. This is very similar to training a an image classifier. You think of this s as a an image. You think of a hat as a label. It's just that there are some behaviors want to be taken. While some actions do not want to be taken. You collect a bunch of this kind of data. You can define a loss function. With this loss function, you can train your actor to minimize this loss function. Then, it's over. You can train a an actor and expect it to perform our actions. You can expect it to perform the behavior we want. And you can even go further. In fact, every action is not just good or bad. It's not just that you want to execute or you don't want to execute. It has a degree of difference for each action. Some are well executed. Some are nice to have. Some are a little bad. Some are very bad. So, just now, we say that every action is either to be executed or not to be executed. This is a binary problem. 
we just use plus 1 or minus 1 to represent it. But now, we change that for each pair of S and A. It has a corresponding score. This score represents that, how much we wish the machine to perform action A1 hat. When it sees S1. For example, the first data and the third data here. We have plus 1.5 and plus 0.5, respectively. It means that we expect the machine can do A1 hat. When seeing S1. When it sees S3, it can do A3 hat. But we expect that when it sees S1. The expectation of doing A1 hat is stronger than. The expectation of doing A3 hat when seeing S3. Then, we hope that when it sees S2. It doesn't do A2 hat. We expect it not to AN hat. When it sees SN. And we really don't want. It to do AN when it sees SN hat. With this information. You can also define a loss function. You are just do something in front of your original cross entropy. Originally, either plus 1 or minus 1 is. In front of cross entropy. Now you change to multiply it by an. You tell the machine. That there is some action. We extremely want the actor to execute. There are some actions that we absolutely don't want the actor to perform. There are some behaviors that are better if executed. There are some actions that I hope to take as few as possible. But even if it is executed, the damage may not be that big. So we use this a n to control the degree of how much every action we want the actor to execute. Then, there will be a loss. We train a theta and find a theta star. Following that, you have an actor whose behavior meets our expectations. Then, the next difficulty is how this a is determined. This is our next difficulty. This is the problem we will face next. Another problem we have to face is that. How the pairs of S and A are generated. How do I know to execute A1 when seeing S1? Or don't execute A2 when seeing S2? This is also a problem we have to deal with later.